My name is Iftah Kuril, I'm the spokesperson at the, at the Israeli Embassy for about two years now. So what makes your job difficult? What I think that um, the job of a spokesperson is always a difficult one because you are trying to get the media to be interested in stuff they're not interested in and to drive them away from the stuff that they are interested in. It's a kind of, a kind of game because, you know, news are usually bad news. It's very hard to, to get the positive stories into the press. We're most interested in the negative stuff that happens. And I think that um, across the world, and especially in the West, um, we've been used to getting bad news from the Middle East. And therefore, Israel, as part of the Middle East, is usually portrayed in a, in a sort of matter that is more negative than positive. So I, th I guess the hardest part of my job is really to convey um, the good stuff that happens in Israel whether the good stuff that has to do with culture and academic life and nightlife and these amazing things that happen in Israel today, or even in the context of the conflict that we have, whether with the Palestinians or our other Arab countries around us, there are a lot of points of light. You know, some are personal stories that I can share and some are NGOs doing amazing work. And, and even those are, are hard to get into the press, not because, you know, they're evil, but simply because they're not used to to these kinds of stories. So that's, I think that's one difficult aspect of the job. Is it really hard to try and convey the positiveness, the positivity in the media? And do you find it demoralizing almost that it's constantly negative in the news? And have you ever wanted to quit, quit your job? <laughs> well, it's not, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. I'm, I'm enjoying my job a lot. I think that it's a privilege to be working in London uh, and in the UK. The, um, the level and the importance of the media in the UK is of global importance because you know the BBC and the Guardian and the Times and Sky are not just about the UK, they are watched all over the world mm -hmm. and they have an impact on Israel's image and on, on what happens all over. You know the ambassador and I were invited uh, a few weeks ago to, to Reuters and they, they let us in on their sort of um, daily uh, editorial um, session where they sit, you know, five, six people with another 10 people on conference call from across the world and Reuters is a news wire that you know provides news for newspapers and they basically in that half an hour meeting decide the news agenda for that day because what they send to the papers and to the broadcast media will be the stories mm -hmm. and so that, that's an amazing thing to be able to work in this environment that is so important so I wouldn't call it uh, demoralizing I think that there are times when, when, when it's more difficult but we do have a lot of success as well, and a lot of uh, funny moments. Um, Israel is in the press so much, and it is of such interest that sometimes even the most sort of um, um, stories that you wouldn't think get in the press, I and mean, they do. Like there was uh, an ostrich that ran away from, uh, from a zoo maybe two weeks ago. And there's a really funny clip that somebody actually took, the, took a, a video clip of this ostrich running down uh, quite a big street in Herzliya, in north of Tel Aviv. And, uh, and it made it to the BBC and I'm, I'm looking at, you know, at, at my television screen in the office and I see the ostrich and I see that this is Israel, I was really surprised. Mm. So those things happen as well. So. Mm. Do you think your job's easier than a spokesperson for another uh, embassy because of the power of the Israel lobby? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Um, I don't think that there is an Israel lobby that is so influential. This is sort of this myth about the Israel lobby and it's an unfortunate myth because sometimes it connects to the myth that the Jews even control the media and this kind of issue and I think that's, that's not true. If it, if it were true, um, the coverage of Israel wouldn't be as it is and it, you know, it's not that great. Um, so I, I, no, I don't think that that has to do with it. I think that, as I said before, the Middle East is covered in a certain way. We're used to be getting bad news from the Middle East, not just Israel, you know, what's happening in ISIS now and in Syria and be, a lot of the countries that we used to know are sort of falling apart, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of, a lot of bloodshed. Um, and so to try and, and look at the positive side is, is sometimes a challenge, sure. Um, when did you decide you wanted to do this kind of work? Well, I've been a diplomat with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, before that, I was working for one of the big daily papers in Israel as an editor and translator. And before that, I studied law and political science. So it's something that was always sort of around in my life that I was thinking about. 
Um, but it's not all spokespersons work, just so you know. I mean, a diplomat in Israeli foreign, foreign affairs does a variety of things. So I started out in Ethiopia at our embassy there, in Addis Ababa, where I did mostly development work, because that's what a lot of Western countries do in Africa. Their embassies are focused on development. Uh, I then moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, where I did press, but also culture and some public diplomacy. And now I'm, I'm here doing this. Beforehand, I was in Israel at our headquarters doing... Um, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, working on the diplomatic aspects, mostly of the Iranian nuclear program, the Syria chemical program, which luckily is now almost gone. But, um, but so the, the work is very diverse. It's not, it's not just about media, because I believe at the end of the day, you know, you, my relationship is not just, the job is not just to appear in front of the media. Um, anybody can do that from Jerusalem. They send me here and pay me a salary to live in London, because of the relationships that I can create with journalists here and with opinion makers and people who write, um, you know, the commentary. And these people, if I'm to convince them of different things that happen in Israel and to convince them of, of an Israeli perspective, I need to have all that background. It's not enough that I'm good in front of the camera. So that's just one aspect. But the actual building of these relationships with, with actual people is oftentimes more important and more, because and, and, I can sit here and somebody will say, well, this is just the Israeli spokesperson. He would say that, wouldn't he? But if I convince truly an influential commentator to write an opinion piece that people will look to, that is sometimes more effective. Do you think, um, or does it ever happen to you that the Israeli government does something that makes you uncomfortable and it makes you uncomfortable being a spokesperson? Sure, it happens all the time. I think it probably happens to everybody that are in, in, in roles such as mine. I have my own opinions about what Israel does wrong or right. We have elections coming up in March. I'm going to vote in the elections you know, the way I see, I see fit. Um, but it's kind of like being a lawyer. You know, sometimes you have um, a client that you can sympathize with. Other times you get a horrible client and you represent them as well. Um, and it's, it's different because, you know, Oftentimes, I, am, I find myself defending um, Israel here on issues which no country should have to defend. You know, like, is Israel, should Israel be allowed to exist? Is Israel's existence legitimate? Um, these kind of things that you hear, there's almost no country, uh, and all countries in their history, including the UK, have done bad things, right? And they continue to do them probably today. And you can criticize and be critical, but you usually don't get into the discussion of, oh, this country is not legitimate for something that it has done. And in Israel, we get that daily. We get people criticizing in a way that, you know, so, so it's very easy for me in that sense to do that, because I don't believe that that criticism is valid. Well, there is, like, criticism that's valid about the, the, the borders, because sure. it, Israel doesn't has never wanted to define strict borders so they can continue to settle. So like the, the boundaries of the country, yeah, is surely that, like, there's some valid debate there. No, there's definitely a valid debate. And, you know, the fact that the borders um, are, are not, um, some of them are not recognized by the international community, for example, the cause of that is our Arab neighbors that have really not accepted some of them, Israel's existence since it was formed according to a UN resolution. I mean, it's all legal in that sense. Um, and so that has caused some of the fluidity of the borders. Usually, a lot of the borders were, are Israeli now because of wars that were started by the Arab countries, whether 48 or 67 and later on. With some of these countries, we managed to um, have a sort of land for peace agreement, as we did with Egypt, for example. With others, we, we so far have not been able to do so, and we are still negotiating. With others, we are not negotiating, like the Golan Heights, which we have annexed, basically, and Right now, I think at least the Israeli point of view is that that was a smart move with all that's happening now in Syria. Had Syria had the Golan Heights today to themselves, we would have these jihadis basically on top of uh, the Kinneret, you know, our, the lake that provides water for, for Israelis. So it's a complex issue. But there are many other such issues around the world. Um, the Turks are, uh, you know, occupying Cyprus. You guys have an ongoing dispute with Argentina over the, over the Falkland Islands. That's, that's part of life, you know, that's part of the relationship between countries. Do you think then it's important for students to get involved in that debate? And in the debate between Israel and Palestine, for example, because Cardiff <coughs> University a few months ago recognised the state of Palestine, 
which might be controversial for you maybe mm -hmm. but do you think that was the right move for the union to do something like that or well the israeli position on recognition of, of the palestinian state is very clear we believe that um, this recognition <laughs> should come um, after the negotiations have, <coughs> have succeeded and agreed upon. Why do we believe that? Because we think that um, if the Palestinians find that there are alternative ways to be recognized, alternative ways which not necessarily, that don't necessarily have an impact on the ground, but have a sort of symbolic impact, um, then, then that does not uh, encourage them to take the hard decisions that they have to take in negotiations. Now, we also have to take some hard decisions in negotiations, and we have now elections that are at least partly focused on those decisions, and you know the Israeli public will, will, will vote. Um, but we, we believe that these outside sort of recognitions are not conducive because negotiations, the sides have to be pushed together to negotiate, not find sort of these alternatives. Regardless of that, I think that uh, campus involvement is, is great, and the university, universities all around the world, um, and especially in the UK where the leading universities of the world sit, um, should encourage dialogue, should encourage talking about these things. There are like, limits on freedom of speech within Israel and the reporters about borders have like, made reports of um, the army um, arresting journalists and is that somewhat hypocritical if Israel doesn't have... Well, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to specifically. I think that um, Israel has one of the freest um, press in the world um, and certainly in the context of the Middle East, our, our democracy and our freedom of press are unparalleled and are usually, um, usually put up against European and Western standards and stand up quite well. You see the freedom of press, you know, the, there is a Freedom House uh, that comes out every year and we're, we're usually in the, in the good group. Uh, if there are violations or there are things that are not perfect, I'm, I'm sure there are. There are so in every country. There was a lot of criticism when, when Guardian, you know, reporters were held here at the airport and, and on the backdrop of Snowden. I mean, that, that happens. But I think that our democracy and our freedom of press are definitely up to, up to the highest Western standards. Last month, then, coming to freedom of speech, the Charlie Hebdo shootings <coughs> outlined the importance of free speech to a lot of people yeah. and the dangers it can come with. Yeah. As a former newspaper editor and uh, a press officer, how important is free speech for you? And do you think restrictions are needed in some places to avoid offending certain religions? And has your view on free speech changed since being a press officer, maybe? No, I think that... Um, I think freedom of speech is uh, an essential part of a functioning democracy. And I think that restrictions are today, not only are they not useful, but they are very, very hard to put in place. Because today, um, you know, newspapers and broadcast media are international. And an Israeli journalist, supposedly, who, let's say, is not allowed to publish something, will publish it on his blog or will give it to his friend in the US or wherever to publish it. So there's no such thing anymore as sort of censorship or these kinds of things. I think that the only time that, for example, in Israel we practice what you could call media censorship is when um, either um, a soldier, uh, God forbid, is killed and uh, the army wants to notify his family before you know, that appears in the press, or if there's a critical national security issue, you know, the, the, there are forces in some kind of uh, on operation, and if that were to be reported now, that would put their lives in danger. So, and these are the sorts of, of situations where, where the Israeli media responsibly you know, will hold a story. I think that's similar here. Because, um, because Israel, like, and Israelis feel like the, the existence of the state of Israel is threatened um, and yeah. there's a high level of securitization yeah. and you feel like that's a threat to democracy because you can justify a lot of things by saying that there's an external threat. Yeah, I understand. Sure. I think that, that's a very legitimate question and I think we, we have this um, you know, balance in Israel between the security needs and between the, the democratic principles and freedom of the press and those things. But I think overall um, in Israel you know, the, the balance is swaying more towards, towards freedom of press. As I said, because it's very difficult to, to enforce any, any you know, restrictions today, and I think that's a good thing. And the press in Israel is very, very robust, 
and very, very active, even more so than in the UK. And, and you know, journalists are... We have currently quite a few politicians on trial or under police investigation because of, you know, things uncovered by the media in Israel. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's definitely just as robust as here. Here as well, your press is, you know, every, every week some new, you know, controversy is uncovered here. So... And the thought that you release something that you really didn't want to release, but had to because of your own. How do you mean release something? Um, give something to the press that maybe you don't agree with, or in any way. Mm. I don't remember in the past year and a half being in that situation. Um, no, it's actually, it was, it, if, if I had any dilemmas, it would be, you know, giving something to the press which I knew may be detrimental to the interests of, to my interest as a spokesperson and representing Israel, but it's something that I knew would at some point reach the media anyway, so I might as well be the one to give it to them and be able to then brief them and say, look, I'm giving this to you, you know this is not a good thing for me, but uh, let me tell you one, two, three about this. So oftentimes, if you build a relationship with, with journalists, you don't, you don't just read them out the talking points, you give them material, and sometimes it's a good material, and other, for you is, is beneficial, sometimes you give them problematic material, but you want to be the one to do it, rather than they get it from somebody else. So yeah, that, that has happened. What do you think uh, kind of steps that Israel would have to take to be a stronger democracy? To be a stronger democracy? Um, good question. Um, well, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of... A lot of challenges, as you said, in Israel that, that have to do with the security situation. I think that when, when we have um, a different situation on our borders, when things calm down, we may be able to... That, that will certainly help Israel's democracy, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I think that overall, you know, no place is perfect, but taking into account the, the stress and the pressures under which Israeli society operates, we, we're doing a, a decent job, I think. That's the way that I, I see it. Do you think some people have an incentive to, to not want peace because Israel is stronger than Palestine and if they, are, they can take advantage of the securitization of the situation, um, Israelis are relatively safe, like that's why um, mm -hmm. people are fleeing uh, anti-Semitism sometimes go to Israel, so it's not as endangered as they would like to portray, and they, um, maybe they don't want a stronger democracy. Well, I think that um, feeling safe is a, is a relative sort of, uh, is a relative issue. If I told you what the Israelis you know, un are undergoing in the past years, it's something that nobody in the UK has felt since the Second World War. You know, and that's something I've felt that I was hiding under you know, the stairwell of my house with my daughters two years ago, not so long, when Hamas was firing grad rockets that hit Tel Aviv. I was hiding in my house you know, as a teenager when uh, Saddam Hussein was firing the Scud missiles in the 90s, the Gulf War. And these are not unique experiences. This is something that's in the sort of um, mental... Every Israeli has gone through this. So I think you can't blame Israelis for... Yeah, we, Tel Aviv is a great city, very open, nightlife. We're, we're, we're a robust democracy and we're strong, but people that feel unsafe have a good reason to do so, I think. Everything is relative, right? We're not in Syria, but we're not in the Lon London either. It's, that's, it's important to remember. I think there are always those who will be against peace. Um, I think that, first and foremost, our problem is with the terror groups that instill this fear. And every time we've had negotiations in the past, even during the Rabin days, Rabin was assassinated under the backdrop of a, a peace agreement during which we had buses exploding in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv every week. So it was a complicated time with lots of people who didn't want peace intervening, you know. And in Israel, sure, I'm sure there are those that also that are not for peace. The difference is that Israel is a democracy and at the end of the day we'll vote and a majority of Israelis want peace and want a two-state solution. That's been shown in polls. And the people who don't want peace will have to you know, suck it up, as they say. The, our problem is that on the other side, the terror groups, they, they, they act and they create the fear, and that's, that's a, different, a more difficult thing to deal with on the other side. You know, in Israel, when we pulled out of Gaza in 2005, we pulled out eight, eight 9,000 settlers who did not want to be pulled out, right? 
but that was done without a single life lost. It was done by the police and the army, and you know, we know how to do that. How will a two-state solution work when there are settlements, um, Israeli settlements intermingled with Palestinian mm -hmm. ones? There's no contiguous state for the Palestinians to live in. Sure. How will that? Um, well, um, I don't remember if it's 90 or 95 percent of the settlements are within what's called settlement blocks. They are close to the Israeli border, and um, and those settlements um, will remain under Israel under future agreement. That's already been discussed and agreed with the Palestinian side in return for these the actual land that these settlements take up, Palestinians will be given other, other land in other parts. The settlements that are outside of these blocks and are, will probably be dismantled unless some, some you know, creative solution enables them to stay in Palestinian territory, I don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that the settlements um, are not the main obstacle perhaps to peace as some would like to view them. Some can view that it's view, you know, that it's wrong for Israel to build on Palestinian land. We can discuss it, it's a historical thing, it didn't, didn't start yesterday. Uh, there have been no new settlements for many years now, but, but I don't think this truly is the main obstacle to peace. There are other major obstacles, but that's not necessarily one of them. Do you think peace is on the horizon then, or are things just getting worse? What would you want to I think it's a complicated question. I think that on the one hand, at least in Israel, most people want peace. And even the, the current Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is on a right-wing party, right, the Likud, um, has acknowledged the two-state solution as, as the solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And these are the positions, if you like, that Rabin held in the 90s. So the positions of the left have to a large extent been, been uh, adopted by the right. So the, the majority of the Israeli political spectrum the large majority is looking at this as a solution. Um, but I think that developments in the region are making it hard for, for the average Israeli to believe that this will actually happen soon because of the lack of trust. Because we, when we withdrew from Gaza, you know, Hamas, a terror group, took over, initially democratically, but there haven't been elections since. So that, that, that was already 10 years ago. Uh, and began firing rockets and accepting money and weapons from Iran. So it became sort of a base to launch attack against Israel. And the fear is that uh, West Bank um, withdrawal, will, the same thing will happen. Another fear is that even if we sign an agreement and all is well, mm -hmm. then you know, in a year or two years or five years, there will be a change of government like we see all across the Middle East now, and a terror group will take over. Or, so it's a complicated thing. Um, you know, sometimes leaders come up that, that do things that are unbelievable. Um, we, we almost had a deal signed, that's, that's the way that people are telling it today in 2000 with Barack and Arafat at Camp David with President Clinton. So it's not as if it's so far away. I think, I think we need some, some you know, brave people on both sides and maybe a geopolitical situation that will be a bit more stable. But there's no doubt that this has to be done. Presumably there'd be less, um, it'd be less likely that people would um, join terrorist organizations if it was, um, if Palestine was economically viable, if, if there was security, if people um, lived peacefully, if, if they felt that they would succeed and that Israel wouldn't, um, and like Israeli settlers like destroying olive trees, things, things yeah. like that, what, what do you think needs to be done? Well, I think, you know, I think, first of all, theoretically what you say is true, it makes sense. But then when you look at history, you see that at the best time for peace during the Oslo process in the 90s, that was also the best time for terror, when terror groups worked as hard as they could and exploded buses in Israel every week, even though the peace process was in full swing and you could almost see a solution in sight. And that's why Israel built uh, the security fence and security wall, you know, the, in order to prevent those. So it's always this give and take. Uh, look at Gaza today. Gaza was not under any of siege, you know, when Israel left. In fact, Israel left in Gaza a lot of infrastructure, you know, a port was planned, the airport was being planned. There was a positive outlook. You'd think that, okay, with this positive outlook, with this, all of Israeli settlers gone, Palestinians' first time of chance of self-rule, I'll bet in this, in, only in Gaza, right? But you'd think they'd, let's take this as an example and show the world, you know, what we, what we can do. And Hamas came in, a, a terror group. Uh, so things don't always work out that way. Now we're in a similar dilemma. We have to rebuild Gaza. We have to get uh, humanitarian supplies in. 
we have to do that without enabling you know rockets to get in just uh, it was published yesterday that the IDF stopped another shipment of materials special materials to build rockets that were coming in through those so it's always this give and take you know how do we deal with the strength and the moderate while dealing with the extremists and you know Rabin our former prime minister used to say that you know we have to fight terror like there's no peace process and fight for peace like there's no terror so that's probably what needs to be done after the so of course, like politically it looked good, but economically people were still like living in settlements um, in Palestinian um, villages without running water. Like the situation wasn't good. You could understand that yeah. there, that some people didn't see the hope that you might. Sure, have. no, that's that's true, and I think that a lot of projects today are aiming exactly at that. What uh, Tony Blair, for example, is doing in the Middle East, he's got a team there working with Israelis and Palestinians. Um, exactly on this, on the improvement of economic life, on how do we get, you know, checkpoints down, how do we get water to the Palestinian city, Ruabi, that's been built, a huge Palestinian city has been built already, 50,000 people uh, are going to be living there. So those things are, are happening and should, should happen. You're absolutely right. What do you think of um, groups within Israel that uh, criticize the government, like Jews for Peace, like people that think that the government isn't doing enough? Well, there's lots of people that, that feel the government isn't doing enough, that criticism is legitimate. Specifically, Jews for Peace, I'm not a big fan. I think that um, I, I was at a conference in, uh, in SOAS uh, earlier, earlier this week, or was it last week? I'm, and they were, they were speaking there and I thought that it was, uh, you know, blaming everything that happened, not only on Israel, but on the Jews themselves, I thought, was a bit way over the top for me, personally. Aren't Jews for peace Jews themselves? It's hardly likely that they're... Yeah, you'd think so, right? But, um, but the stuff that they said there was, for me, outrageous. Um, you know, saying that uh, we Jews can only live as victims, and therefore every, everything we do has to do with our victimhood. And Doesn't the Israeli government do make the same mistake of conflating Israelis with Jews worldwide? Well, Israel was formed as a haven for the Jews post the Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, when you know, most of world Jewry was destroyed in Europe. Um, I think that we are, a, the fact that we are a Jewish country, you know, doesn't mean that we're not a democracy. Cameron has called the UK a Christian country quite a few times recently and he said we have to strengthen the Christian values if you remember now without saying if I agree with that or not I can say that um, in Israel we have 20% minority that are non-Jews and they have by far the highest lev level standard of living freedoms across the Middle East from there you know the other Arabs in the Middle East and so we're proud of that. Well, what more could be done to, to feel like how how are you meant to feel in a Jewish state as a non-Jew? Well, you're meant to feel like a minority feels here in the UK. You probably have some problems as a minority. Life is not perfect. There's always going to be some prejudice and racism that has to be handled and fought. Um, but in Israel today, we're going to have probably 12 members of Knesset from the Arab parties. We have a Supreme Court judge who is an Arab. We have an Arab judge who puts the former Israeli president in jail. He was the one, you know, judge him for... We have um, non-Jews serving in the IDF. We have, we have a pretty, pretty good, normal functioning society. What about, um, I can't remember who said it, but there was a comment in, like, in, in someone in the Israeli government that said that Christians should join the IDF, but the Arabs shouldn't because Christians are the Jews' natural friend and it would seemed racist and... Well, first of all, they're both, they're all Arabs. I mean, we have Arab Christians and yeah. Arab Muslims. Um, but I don't know, I don't, I don't remember, I don't know who said that. Um, I think that the, the, um, the IDF service is mandatory um, for, for all Israelis and some who are non-Jews are, are exempt. They can still volunteer, of course, but they are, they don't, it's not mandatory for them. And, you know, sometimes in a country as complex as Israel, um, you know, it's, it's good that things are not cut, clear cut, you know, and you leave some gray areas to deal with those differences, and that's fine as well. Uh, the IDF is only part of 
you know, the Israeli society and the spectrum of activity that you can do. Many people who are religious, for example, uh, don't want to go to the IDF for these reasons, because they don't want to, you know, ultra-religious, don't want to be near people who are, to, who are um, secular for example, or, and so they do community service instead of IDF. They go and work at a hospital or, or some, somewhere in their community. So creative solutions like that are, are found all the time, both for um, ultra-Orthodox Jews and for um, some um, Arabs or Muslims who would rather work in their community, in, the, in their village or wherever for those one or two years. So, you know, things, that's the way it goes. So you were in the IDF, you didn't volunteer as some, uh, in the community or anything like that, you were in the IDF? Yeah, I was an officer in the artillery. And did that, um, how did that affect like, your choices afterwards, like what you wanted to do? Did it make you proud of Israel and make you want to be this spokesperson? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that most of all, the things that I learned in the army didn't have a, a direct um, relationship to the army, to what I did, you know, firing a cannon or whatever. It usually has to do more about uh, commanding people, what it means to be in charge of the lives of young of people who are usually six months younger than you, you know, and you're their commander now, and, and, and gives you a lot of confidence in, you know, you achieve, you achieve uh, you, missions which, in which you really don't have any option to fail. You, you have to achieve those goals because either lives of people depend on it, either your lives or the lives of others that you are, that you are defending. And so in that sense, it gives you a sense of purpose. It gives you also a lot of tools for, for life af afterwards. Um, some, some people go through positive experiences in the army, other people leave the army, you know, with, with scars. It's not an easy experience for everybody. And um, it's, it's something that we have to do. It's not something that we are necessarily eager or love to do. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank you.